All right, and like I said, I'll, I'll probably go to about 12.30. Um, I'll stick around to answer questions. Um, if, you know, if, if, if you'd like to see anything in more depth than what I show you initially, certainly we can take time to do that. But I'll plan to uh, give you everything that I can over the next 30 minutes. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. So just a couple things about Khan Academy. Why does everybody use Khan Academy? Um, first and foremost, it's free free for you to use as an educational tool, free for your students. Um, it also um, enabling your students to do this, being that as, as it's free, that means that if they go on to post-secondary school, they can use this for any college math they might take or you know, any other, you know, anything else that they do that they need support with. This, is, this can be a lifelong learning tool for all of your students. Um, another really nice thing about it is it's very mobile friendly. Um, it's something that for your students that maybe don't have good computer access to the internet, it's very mobile friendly. There's an app that's web-based and the important thing about the app being web-based is there's a free ESL resource called USA Learns that I'm doing a webinar on tomorrow that has an app. That app is not web-based, so when the students do work on the USA Learns app, it doesn't track time. When they do work on the Khan Academy app, it does track time. So if your students use the Khan Academy app, as long as they're signed into your class, which we'll, we'll talk about, then you'll be able to see the time that they work and, and track all of the work that they do. The lessons are also very short, which can be very nice for students to be able to, if they have like 15 minutes, they might be able to watch a couple of videos. So unlike some of the resources that maybe a student has to sit block off like an hour or two to really sit down and benefit from. This is something that students can do in short bursts. It also has a very nice system for allowing students to master specific skills. So for example, like adding fractions with like denominators or identifying pronouns or something like that, where they can get practice to actually master those specific skills, which is great. The math content is, there's a crazy amount on there. Uh, starts actually with pre-K and goes up into college math, like um, differential equations, you know, things like that. The, 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 the K through 12 content is common core standards aligned, which means that you can align it to the college and career readiness standards. Uh, there's now ELA content, for those of you maybe who thought of Khan Academy as only a math resource. There are some grammar lessons on there, and they've just recently launched some reading content, uh, which is, I think, from first grade through eighth grade is how it's organized, and we'll look at that. And then there are also science and social studies. There's, there are computer lessons on there, coding, just all kinds of things. So there's a, there's a lot of content. Um, and we'll take a look at the site here in just a second. I mentioned that it's mobile friendly. These are screenshots that I took of uh, from my uh, smartphone. Uh, it's a Samsung uh, Note 9, I think it is. So it's like a year or two old. Uh, but this is just kind of what it looks like. So just so that you can see what your students would see if they're working on this from an app. Now this screen on the left, uh, where it says Math Pre-Algebra, this is kind of like the home screen. And one of the things that I'll show you is how you can assign lessons to your students. So you can see this is me logged in as a student and it shows me some of the different lessons that I should be working on. So it kind of gives them, so if you assign lessons to your student, then they can work on the things that you're, you're inviting them to work on. Um, this um, gets a little deeper into one of the, you know, one of the little mini units uh, on arithmetic properties. So as you can see, I can see what I've worked on here. I can see what progress I've done. Um, the little things on the left, like if it's a little arrow, like finding place value, um, a little little uh, triangle or arrow, that means that it's a video. If it's the purple thing, um, or you know, like like place value when multiplying and dividing by ten, those are the practice activities where students can practice something until they master it. And the little crown on top means that I've mastered it. It kind of shows how much progress I've made. And then this is actually what a lesson looks like. So right up here, I would watch a video. 
And as you can see, this video right now here is about two and a half minutes long. I'm a half hour in and there's, there's two minutes to go. So the videos are very short. They're very discreet. So again, they're, they're very easily easy for your students to digest. And then this shows me some of the things that I'll be working on moving forward. Um, but I just wanted you to see it, it actually, the, the app works very nice for this. Um, just a couple things to keep in mind. If you want to use this to track time for your students, which I'm guessing most of you do, your students will need to, to log in. Um, one of the things with it being free is they can do work without logging in, which means that you don't get to see their progress or their time. It's, there, there is content outside of math and it's ever expanding, but it's still not completely, they're not gonna get all of the ELA content that they need, but they will get some ELA content. Same thing with science and social studies. Uh, it's not really designed for adult education. It's common core aligned. Um, some, of the, um, some of the activities, I don't think any of them are overly childish, but it's not, it, it is something that's developed more for K through 12 and, and for college. The navigation's a little loose. Um, students can basically at, look, work on anything they want to. Even if you assign them lessons, they can still hunt around and you know they can be looking at a calculus lesson or they can be looking at a, an algebra lesson even if they're at a you know even if they're at like a pre preschool level for math or something like that um, so it is something that that students can get frustrated with they can get off track with sometimes um, so that's just something to kind of keep in mind and the other thing is the short lessons means that there is a lot of content um, one of the things that I've done that, I, that I'd just like to show you is um, I put together a spreadsheet and I'll share this with anybody who's interested where I took one of their fraction units and I broke it down uh, in a way that it's that it's easy to manage. So the unit as a whole has 60 videos and 50 exercises. So when you assign that to your students, they're going to see this long 110 item list to work on just for fractions. So it's gonna look very overwhelming. So that's one of the things with the short videos and the short lessons is there's a lot of them and, and it can be very intimidating for students to look at. It might be intimidating for teachers to look at. So one of the things that you'll want to do is you'll want to try to manage what your students are working on so that it doesn't seem like it's, it's this endless um, list of things that they need to work on. Those are just a couple things um, up front that I thought would be um, important just to kind of ground everybody in what they're doing. Um, so now we'll take a look at, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and take a look at the site. Um, so when I log in, I have a teacher account. Um, uh, when I log in, this is what I see then as a teacher. Okay, I see welcome. Um, and then along the, the top, kind of sort of the top here, it says classes with the blue underline, students and resources. Those are kind of like my tabs as a teacher that I primarily work on. So obviously the classes allows me to manage the classes that I have. So as you can see, I have a few classes set up here and, and these are all like sample classes. I can manage my students. So these will be all of the students that are in my classes. So I can just kind of look and see, um, what they are, what their username is, and then which class they're in. And then if I click on a specific student, um, like Jon Snow, that's, that's uh, for Game of Thrones fans, um, I can kind of get some information about what he's done. I can just get an overall look at, at each individual student. So I can see the last streak that he had, he worked one day in a row, that was back in February 16th. So, you know, just some information. I honestly don't do a whole lot with, with looking at the students themselves um, individually like this, but it is something that you can do. Um, and then if you need help with something, of course, you can always contact me. Um, you can always, um, you probably have somebody at your program who's, who's you know, maybe good with this. Um, but it also has resources on here that you can use um, to kind of get started and to get help as you're, as you're moving forward. All right. But the meat of what you're going to be doing is going to be in this classes tab. 
okay now obviously when you get started you don't have a class in there so one of the first things that you would want to do as a teacher is to add a new class and it's pretty straightforward all I have to do is put a name in um, it can be whatever I want to call it so like let's, let's say Chuck's test class and I might already have that in there so I'll just put a one there if you're using Google Classroom I can import my class from Google Classroom into my Khan Academy class. So I can kind of sync those two if I want to, but I'm not gonna worry about doing that. And hit next. And then it's gonna ask me to add courses. And this is where I should mention, there is a very big difference in Khan Academy between courses and classes. So classes are your groups of students, and then courses are the pre-made um, pre con content that you, can, that you can assign to your class. Most of what you do um, with your students um, it, it for adult ed is going to be early math for very like kindergarten, first grade, like counting, um, you know, very, ba very, very basic, arithmetic and pre-algebra. And as you'll see, I can add however many of these I want to any particular class. So one of the things that you can think about as you're setting this up is, do I just wanna put all of my students in the same class and then add all of these courses to it? Or do I wanna have different classes and different courses? Um, it probably isn't a huge difference. It's probably more just a personal style. If you have a lot of students, you might want to have different classes that you can put them in. Just to, it makes it a little bit easier to look at their progress and things like that. If you're only going to be working with maybe 10 students, maybe you just want to create one class, but then have different courses for your students. Um, but so anyways, I probably, you know, I don't think I want algebra one for this group, but maybe I want something then that I can assign different levels to different students. As you can see, I can also add by grade level. So I can just have first grade math, second grade math, third grade math up through eighth grade. Um, and then I also have all of these subjects and then there's the science and engineering, if you have students who are working on their science, um, you can set them up for that here. Um, there's some more different ways that math can be grouped uh, um, according to different curriculum. Information for computing. Arts and Humanities has history, so US history, if you have students who are, are prepping for the social studies uh, test in the, in the high set or the GED, you have some information here that can be helpful. Um, and economics and finance, we probably would stay, stay away from a little bit. And then here's our language arts beta. So we have second grade reading, third grade reading and vocabulary, fourth grade ELA, which is integrated. Um, so just all these different things that I can add. So I can add any of them, like I said, to this class. So I have what I want in there. So I'm just gonna click next. And now I can add my students. Um, there's a couple of different ways that I can do this. Again, I can link it with my Google Classroom. If my students already have accounts or if I want them to create their own accounts, I can give them a link so that they can join. Or, and this is what many of you might want to do, is I can create my own students' accounts. And all I need to do is enter a student name. Um, let's say John. Smith. It creates a username for him and then I can add however many I want. So let's say Sally Smith. And again, so it creates those usernames. And then it automatically creates their password and I can change the password if I want to. Maybe I want all of my students to have the same password to make it easier to manage and then I create those accounts and then I can give that information to those students. All right and then I can download that as a spreadsheet if I'd like to. Okay so 
that's all that you need to do to create a class. And as you can see right here, I have this class now available to me. And there's my roster. All right, so that's all that you need to do to create a class. I've created my student accounts. If my students already have accounts, is I can also give them this code and they can enter that and then they will automatically be entered into your class. So that's another way that I can that I can put my students in my class. But one of the nice things is you can do it as as kind of like a bulk um, bulk thing to do. So that works out pretty nicely. All right. Um, any questions so far? Okay, we do have a, a chat question. Chat, this is Ronnie. Yeah. Uh, hey, Ronnie. Hey, I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. Listen, I just want to verify. Um, I, I'm going to be creating a class to, this, when we're finished here for my advanced ESL class. Mm -hmm. And I want them to do reading. Along, what I'm understanding you to say is I can send them the link to join and the system is automatically then going to list their name so I know who's enrolled. I want to know who enrolled and who's taking part of it. So will I be able to see that information if they join? Yes, yeah, so if they, if they do that, then you will be able to, then they will be on your roster. So when you see, so like for any of my, yeah, that should put them in your class and you should see them. Um, what I would, I, oh, go ahead, Ronnie. What I need to do is just send them the code and they can join. Yes, they'll need to create an account themselves if they haven't already done so. And actually, I'll pull that up right here. So, is it actually easier for the student for me to put their name in? I want to make this as easy as possible for them. If you, if you, I, to, the safest way to do it is for you to create the account. Okay. And then just to give the information to your students, give them the link with the username and password. Um, the only thing is if they if they already have an account, sometimes it gets a little goofy. Like when I go into Khan Academy, it always defaults to the last whatever account I was in under. Like I have about 10 different student and teacher accounts for practicing different things. So whenever I pull up Khan Academy, it, whatever the last thing I used it under, whether it was Chuck Klinger, John Smith, John Snow, Daryl Dixon, whatever, that's what it remembers. So it always defaults to that. So that's the only way that it gets a little dicey is if you have students managing multiple accounts, then okay. it might be something that gets lost. Does that make sense? It does. Now, one other question. If I give them all the same password, can they access each other's course? Or no, because their username would be separate. So like, so they'll have a unique username and then they'll have the, the password that's, that you created for them. Okay. Thank you. You answered my questions. Okay, great. Hey Chuck, Marianne. Hey Marianne. So I'm just going to restate that to make sure I understand. So you can um, set up the username yourself for the student and, and it goes through what you just showed us, assigning a username and password. Or yes. your student could use the class key to enter your class if that had not been done. Correct. And, uh, and then they would also be, at that point, does it then assign them a username and password if they put the class key in? Yes. It, well, two things. One, if they already have an account, then they can add that to their existing account. So it can be like another class that they're in. So like the, on the same account, a student could be in a couple of classes. Okay. So that would include them in your class. If they don't have an account, when they create an account, so like if I click sign up here, and I want to sign up as a learner, so I put my information in. Oh, you can see right here, it asks for the class code oh, okay. as a learner. Now, so if in other words, this is someone who has not yet signed into, has not registered on Khan Academy at all. They're coming exactly. Yeah, this is, this is a different browser. So this is, like you can see, it's asking me to log in. But uh -huh. instead, I click sign up. And, you know, I can sign up as a parent, teacher, or learner. So for those okay. of you that don't have it, I'm sorry, just let me finish this real quick. Sorry, okay, man. Sure. For those of you that don't have accounts, that's what you'll do is you'll go to sign up. 
And then you'll make sure that you sign up as a teacher though. That's the important thing. Now, sorry, for your learners, what, what were you gonna say? So here they're logging in, it's the first time. They could enter that class code right there and click on that. Or if they were to do it without a class code, where does it ask for their, you know, I guess they just click learner and they go through the whole month, day, year, birth date. Yeah, even if, the, even if they have a class code, it's still gonna, they're still gonna need to put that information in to create their account. So okay. I put my, my birth date in and I can sign up for however I wanna sign up. And then, like I said, I can enter my class code or if I already have an account. So it gives them, it gives them options. This is the thing where for your students that are sort of computer savvy, then they probably they might already have an account or they can probably do this pretty comfortably. For your students who are not comfortable with computers, you might want to just set it up so that you all you have to do is send them a link, a username, and a password. And then that way they can get in. Okay, thanks. Oh, sure. Okay, um, just, I'm sorry, I'm just for the pause here. I'm looking at a couple questions in the chat. So Carolina, Carol asked uh, if I have different levels of math proficiency in my class and I want to assign different courses, do I have to create three different classes? No, you can create the same class and you can actually make assignments to individuals within the same class, like different assignments. And I'll, I'll show that next. Um, but yeah, the answer is no. The only way that I'd say you'd want to make different classes is if you have a lot of students that you're trying. I, th I think it's more manageable if you don't have like a giant 50 person class or something like that. Um, okay, so another question, how do I get into the classes uh, themselves so I can see exactly what the course content is? We'll look at that here in just a second. Jay, Jay Joyce. Uh, Christy, I, I touch a GD class with another, uh, uh, teach, I assume that is, with another teacher. Is it possible to have two teachers assigned to the same class? Yes, you would have to use the same login information, I believe. I, I don't think that there's a way that two different logins can share the same class, but we'll, we'll play around with that a little bit, and if we find out a way that you can do that, I'll let you know. Okay, so good questions. All right, so that's how you set up your, your class. That's how you just, we just looked a little bit at how you set up an account. Um, and now let's look at once you have your class, once you have your students, then, um, oh, the last thing that I'll say before moving on is if you, as you're working on this, if you run into trouble, I'll be happy to work with you individually, um, just briefly, of course, but where you share your screen and I can kind of look at what you're trying to do and make sure that it's, it's, that it's sound. Um, I, I don't mind doing that. You know, if obviously if everybody in the state wants that, then we may have to have a waiting list, but, um, but I don't, I don't mind working with you on supporting some of you on setting things up as well. But I, all I ask is that you kind of try it yourself first. Okay. So I have my class and um, let me look at this one right here. It's an algebra. No, actually I want to look at, I want to look at this one right here, pre-algebra. So when I click on it, um, it, it will usually take me to the last thing that I looked at with it. Now, most of the work that I do is going to be along the left here, where these tools are and this administration is. So the first thing is activity overview. If I want to see what my students have been doing, when I click on this activity overview, it will give me a list of the students in my class how many total minutes they work during whatever uh, time period I've given. Have they leveled up in any skills? Have they done any activities and shown mastery? And have they worked on any skills that they haven't uh, done anything in? And I've done, I haven't done much with this class as you can see for a while. But uh, as you can see, one of my students did do nine minutes, one skill. Um, and as you can see, this is the date range, January 1st to March 23rd. I can make that the last seven days. I can just make that for today, the last seven days, the last 30 days, or I can do a custom range. So whatever time period you're looking for, you know, it could be the last year, it could be the last 
27 days, whatever you want to enter, it will show you these three things pretty much in a nutshell. And then if I want to see what skills they worked on, I could click on him individually and start to look at his individual profile. Or I can start to look at, now remember, this is the mastery, or the, I'm sorry, the activity overview. I could start to look at the course mastery and I can look at their progress. I can look at specific skills that they worked on or I can look at it by student and I can see which, what, di, what each individual student did. All right. And again, it gives you uh, whatever the date range you're looking for. Um, course mastery is a little new. I don't do a lot of work with that, um, with, with any of like my, my actual students. Um, then the other thing that I can look at is under assignments. I can make assignments and this, this kind of gets a, at the whole gist of whether to have one class, two classes, however many classes. Um, so this is based on the, the, the courses that I put in. Now for this, I have early math as a possibility. So as you can see, these are different units I can put in. And this gives you the common core standards that they apply to. So you can see this is all kindergarten uh, and first grade content and, and a little bit of second grade content. Okay, And then as we go, it gets up into third grade. So it just kind of gives you a little bit of a sense of, of what this, you know, what this is about. If they're beyond that, then I can click on this and I can assign arithmetic which is more, you know, a little bit of kindergarten. It gets more into third and fourth grade, uh, and then gets up a little higher. So as you're thinking about it, you can think about what level your students are at. Um, so as you can see, decimals gets into, you know, a little bit, little bit more advanced. And then I can assign um, pre-algebra. And this gets into more of your content. Now, with this, so each of these, within each course, there are several units. And then I can break the unit down even further. So I could assign this unit right here. Or that's 75 activities just with this arithmetic properties. Or I can break it down and assign specific lessons within it. Maybe I just want to assign the first four lessons for this week. Um, and notice there's a quiz here. And then I can just click on assign. And, you know, there's question sets in here. So do I want each student to have the same questions? Do I want them to have different questions? Um, since nobody's working together, I'd probably give them the same. And now this is the feature that, that uh, somebody had asked about. I can assign it to all of my students or I need to scroll down here a little bit. Sorry about that. Or I can just assign it to some of my students. I can assign it to Daryl Dixon and Rachel Green, but maybe I don't want to assign that to John Snow. So I can assign it to, so I can assign it individually or I can assign it as a class. Um, or like I said, I can assign it to all. I can put a due date on here so you can manage your students work. I could actually go on right now. And I mean, let's assume that we're going to be in this for the next four weeks, um, in this situation, I could actually map out what they're, what I want my students to work on this week by making Friday, the due date. And then I could make more assignments and have them do, so I'll go ahead and assign these. Takes a little bit of time. And then I could assign um, the next round. So then I could assign more under this arithmetic properties. You know, maybe I wanna do order of operations, arithmetic properties, distribute all through quiz two. And I can assign those all students and I could make them do the following. 
So I could map out, so I could stagger, and that way when my students look, they're going to see a limited number of assignments that they're working on. Okay. Um, so hopefully that made sense. I don't, does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, that made sense. All right. Um, just a couple of other things to show you then in terms of how it works. So that's how you do your assignments. That's how you, that's how you do your assigning. So again, any course that's in here, I can choose from. If I want to add more courses, I can do that. So if you start a group and they're, you know, everybody's at a low level and you just put um, arithmetic and early math in there, if they make really good progress, I can add pre-algebra in there um, by doing, just by editing my courses. Chuck? Yeah. Uh, this is Marty. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Number one, um, who checks their work once they're done? Well, that's a program, ideally the teacher's going to. Um, now in this situation, and that's something that I think that I want to get into in our webinar next week that we're going to do. Um, our program where we have sometimes multiple teachers working with the same group of students, um, you know, we, we have like maybe one teacher teach Monday and Wednesday, another teacher teach Tuesday, Thursday, or team teaching. Um, we have, we've had our teachers just split our students up and each one is kind of like working with a group of students. So, you know, but ideally the, the teacher is going to do this. Um, actually check the work is pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, so another, if I just want to see, you know, again, if I just look at my activity overview, I can see which of my students and I can just look at last seven days and you won't see anything for any of these students, but I can see who's been working. Right, so I, I can at least get that time that I can report. I can see if they're making progress. I can see if they're struggling with something, if they've worked on a skill and haven't made progress. So that can at least help me to triage my students. Under assignments, if I look at scores, then I'm going to get a list and because, um, and try and get out here where they've actually done, somebody's done something. Apologize for the delay here. No problem. Unfortunately, I think I have to get to fractions. But what will happen is if they watched a video, like this tri this triangle here means it's a video, it'll just be green and have a check mark. These writing, these pencils, means that there are activities that students do, and it will actually show you the percent that they got correct. So that's, that's how you can get a little bit more detailed information about what they've worked on. Hopefully, if you have it set up where you're assigning specific things, it will show you mainly this will be limited to the things that you've assigned for your students. So a question, though. Uh, yeah. You talked about it'll show uh, the percent. But again, this is after the teacher grades it. No. Oh, good. Okay. I see your question. No, actually when they do activities, Khan Academy, they'll see actually what their score was. Um, it's something that, that Khan Academy actually scores for them. I see. Okay. Now another question, actually there's two more. Um, when you showed us a list of the, the tests that, you know, Khan Academy can help with. I saw the SATs and I saw others, but I didn't notice a GED. No, it's not. Um, like I said, it's it's really more of a K through 12 resource, but the instruction is very, very appropriate for adults. It's just not organized right now in a way that is, um, that it's, it's not organized for the GED test. Okay. And, and yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. That's okay. I, uh, what do you call, um, I teach th for the college, not only GED, but I also do SAT prep. Oh. And mm -hmm. it, there's a great similarity between the SAT and the GED. Mm -hmm. 
The SAT, of course, is harder, in my opinion, but as far as the subject areas, they're very similar. So if it can be used for SAT, then I would think that it should also be able to be used for the GED. I think so. I, I mean, I think that the content, a lot of the content is shared. So when we look at, um, I work a lot with the pre-algebra, like I said, the early math, arithmetic, and pre-algebra. I think that that's going to give your students most of what they need to be prepared for the for the GD. I think there's there are good progressions in there. Um, a lot of the content overlaps, though. So you'll see when you look at courses, you know, you'll see, um, you know, they have the math, early math, arithmetic, pre-algebra but they also have math by grade, so first grade. So a lot of all the math that's in first, or so there's a lot of overlap between like the first grade and the kindergarten and the, um, and the pre, and the, the, the arithmetic piece. There's a lot of overlap between the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade and the pre-algebra. So yeah, so I mean, I, I think it's a matter of picking the courses that have the content that you want for your students. Okay, another thing is that uh, there are these letters OAD, EEA, NSA, yes. and I'm not quite sure what they stand for. Okay, a oh, good question. These are actually the common core state standards that they apply to. Okay. So like the three, and just real quickly, the, the three means third grade. Mm-hmm. OA means um, operations and algebra. And the D is just like a, a, a signifier. And then like the six is sixth grade um, ex, uh, expressions and equations. And, uh, you know, again, that's like the first one. Is there a list that we could actually see these as abbreviations? Um, yes, I don't know if it's on Khan Academy, but that's something that you could probably just do like a Google search for of like common core domains. Okay, that sounds good. And my last question okay. is that um, when these assignments are given, the students do them individually when they have time. But do you schedule a meeting when we all get together online? That's a, that's depends on program capacity. Um, what, the way that this worked prior to, you know, the, all the classes needing to suspend was I think most programs did, they taught the students in class. And then if students wanted to do extra work, then they could go to Khan Academy. So there was a lot of support there. The reality now is I think your, most of your students are probably going to be that are able to and willing and have time and, and, things like that, they're going to be doing this work in Khan Academy. I do think that it's a good idea to have a, a way to check in with your students, obviously, to see, you know, to review their progress, you know, pat them on the back for good things they're doing, support them with things that they're having trouble with, so that they don't get stuck and they can keep moving forward. Some programs are doing that individually. Our program, for example, we're using uh, something called Google Hangouts. Like if you use Google Docs or Gmail or things like that, it's just another Google product um, where the day two, and we meet four times a week, let's say at nine o'clock for our face-to-face -face classes. So two days a week at nine o'clock, we're inviting our students to join this Google Hangouts where they can interact with each other and their teacher. And then that's a place where the teacher can review the work they've been doing. Maybe try to do a little teaching through there. Um, I know other programs are more reliant on phone and texting um, and maybe doing more individually. Um, it's just so much of it just depends on your capacity and your comfort with using technology and your students' comfort with using technology. Um, I don't, I don't know if that answers your question or not, though, Marty. It, it basically does. And uh, the final thing is, uh, I would imagine we need to know all the students' emails so that we can contact them initially. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the school will have to provide us with that because I teach, uh, as I said, uh, GED level. We have two levels at the college. Uh, 
for the adult literacy and one is called ABE, Adult Basic Education, the other is GED. So my students, I teach the GED level math and the GED level RLA. So basically uh, to get in touch with them, the college really, I guess, has to provide me with all of their emails. Well, and, and to be honest, Marty, different programs are even handling staffing differently. Um, you know, I know some, I think some programs are, you know, have work that teachers can do. Um, and some programs are limiting, you know, how many hours their staff are working because of the situation that's going on now. Uh -huh. So uh, that's more of a program to program decision in terms of, of how they're going to, to manage that. I think some programs have shut down completely. Mm -hmm. um, I work with the statewide distance learning project where we actually work with students that programs can't work with because they're purely at a distance. And a couple of programs have asked us about picking up their students while they're closed. So that, that's something more to talk about as a program. Okay, so basically after having learned what we learned this morning, I then contact my supervisor and she will let me know to you know, what degree I'll be using this with the students. Yeah. And I think maybe you could just let her know that, Hey, you feel comfortable or you, you know, you, you participated in this on Khan Academy. So you think it's something your students can do and yeah. And kind of go from there. Great. Thanks so much. Okay. Sure. Um, so we've gone way over time, but there were good questions and I rambled on about a few things maybe longer than I needed to. Um, I'll stay on. I'll be happy to answer any other questions anybody has. You can type them in the chat. You can, you know, unmute yourself and, and ask questions. Um, if there's anything else that you'd like to see or see in more detail. Um, but I think that's probably gives you hopefully a good sense of, of how Khan Academy works. Hey, Chuck. Yeah. Um, the one thing I know one of my instructors asked earlier in the chat, um, yeah, he's asking it again. Jay, Jay was wondering, and maybe this is like USA Learns, when you're in as an instructor, are you able to actually see, go and see the different courses? I know oh. in USA Learns, you have to go back in as a student. You're kind of, you can't get in and see the courses as an instructor. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I apologize. I thought, I didn't, yeah, I missed that. I saw the question. I thought it meant more just the, the content, not the actual content. So, um, yes, yeah, so you can actually go in, uh, first of all, just, I want to mention Patricia, uh, Kovalchuk mentioned they use remind.com. Um, it's a good way to do, it's like a texting app where you can text groups of students or classes. So if you have a lot of students that text, that's a really good resource. So thanks for sharing that Patricia. Um, yeah, so you can, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, one is, sorry, let me close something here. Okay. So one is if I click on this arithmetic properties, go in here. And so even within, so arithmetic properties is the unit, which is in the pre-algebra course. Then there's a lesson called place value then I see finding place value, which is a two minute video. So if I click on that, that will actually open up the video that I can watch. Oh, great. Okay. So, um, but you don't really see the layout of the course. I, I, if I recall, and I haven't been in Khan Academy as a student recently, I see more of the courses laid out differently, right? Yes. I mean, I can click, I can go in here on courses and just go directly to a course as well. So I can just click on this pre-algebra and then this, this was a good question. And actually, sorry, I didn't show this to you earlier and I can look now. So here's the course and then these are the units and the lessons within. So I can get kind of like a sense of the whole course. Is, is that what you're Yeah, I think that's probably, does that answer it, Jay? I think, I think that that's what he's looking for, is how to see what a student would see when you're in as an instructor. I know in USA Learns, it's totally different views from going in as an instructor right. as a student. Yes, yeah. so this is, this is a way that you can kind of preview the content. And then 
again, if I want to, I can click on any particular lesson. So we have the course pre-algebra, the unit arithmetic properties, and then all of these are lessons. And then each lesson has multiple videos. Um, so I want to see something on the distributive property. And this is similar to how the student's going to see it then. So they can kind of see what their progress is. And you can see, so I have to get three out of four questions right on my practice. Um, I can watch a video, I can read text, and then there's the review, and then these are the practice things. So let's see. Chuck? Yeah. Uh, Marty again. Uh, to get the ball rolling for, as a teacher, we go into Khan Academy website? Oh, I'm sorry, what's that, Marty? Uh, to get this started as a teacher, do we go into Khan Academy's website? Yes, just go to khanacademy.org or just do a search for Khan Academy and it'll probably be the first thing that comes up. And when you're there, um, you know, again, if you're not logged in, then just click this. If you don't have access already, just click here where it says sign up and that's how you can create your account. Okay. Again, and make sure you sign up as a teacher. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay. So there was a question too about how can they get to class code and bypass default? I'm not sure what the bypass default means. Um, if students have an account, if you have an account, you can enter the class code um, by clicking right in here. Like if they click on their name when they're logged in and go under learner home, I think it's under learner home. And right here where it says teachers, I can join a class. Okay, so again, just to repeat that, because I was, wasn't 100% sure what I was doing it. So I go under my name, I go under Learner Home, and I go under Teachers, and that's where I can join the class. And as you can see, I also have a student ID, which is really pretty crazy. All right, so a couple hey. more questions on here. Check. Yeah. Can, can students see who else is in the class or can they see their own name? Uh, anytime I've done it as a student, I've only ever seen my own name in there. I haven't, honestly, it's not anything I've tried to do. So I, I don't think that they can. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's. Okay. it's All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, another question about distance learning time. Okay, really good questions, Barry. Um, we, with the distance learning project, well, let me put this a, a couple ways. Um, I would say the, the question is about recording distance learning time, uh, setting time expectations, and can students self-regulate? With the distance learning project, we, it's the only way that students are supposed to participate, that's, they're only doing distance. We actually do have minimum time requirements that they work. Doing supplemental distance learning is supposed to be voluntary. So, uh, but if the students opt in, then that's, I'll, I'd say um, somebody from your program should probably talk to their advisor about that. Um, I'll mention that during my next call with um, my advisor from PD, because it, it is a good question, I think. There's, especially if this is all that they're doing or this is gonna be their primary way to learn, if they're only doing like five minutes a week, they're not going to really benefit from doing it. So I, you know, so I don't think that it's bad practice to. Um, can students self-regulate? What we try to do is we try to negotiate, some students are very good at it, some students aren't. We try to talk to all of our students about when they're going to do their work and try to hold them to it. So, you know, are you gonna work on the weekends? Are you gonna work, um, you know, some students do work while they're at lunch. You know, if they're working, they, they work while they're, they're taking their lunch. 
Some students work as soon as they get home from work, some as soon as they get up in the morning. But we really try to work through with each of our students a plan for when they're going to do work and then hold them accountable to doing it then. Uh, because a lot of students really struggle to. to... Yeah, you're welcome, Barry. Um, all right, so uh, Sue, what I'm going to ask you to do is email me that because I'm um, I'm actually doing more work on some of the spreadsheets, so I'm probably going to send some stuff out to anybody who's interested. Sue uh, asked about the the spreadsheet that I showed, um, which is uh, this one right here. Um, yeah, I'll be happy to send that out. Just shoot me an email and ask for it, and I'll send this to you. This is just specific to fractions. Um, I'm working on one right now on the whole pre-algebra uh, course because I think that's where a lot of our learners really are going to benefit from. Um, and again, what I'm going to ask is anybody that would like me to email them any of this content, send it to send me an email request, and I'll I'll type my email address here. Um, if I can, for Word document. My email address is uh, C Klinger. at tiu11.org. Make that bigger. Yeah, so just email me, you know, email, send an email to that email address and I will send you that spreadsheet that I already have on, which is basically just the fractions unit and how I would lay that out um, into three sections, kind of like three sets of assignments for my students. And I'm working on the same thing. I'm hoping to have the pre-algebra, the whole course done by the end of this week, although that might be too ambitious. Okay, good question. Helen asks about the English language arts section. Um, I'm actually a, I do a lot of math training. Like I'm a, I used to be a high school math teacher. So that's, that's what I look at the most and that's what I teach and that's what I've done the most with. And I understand the, the CCRS math really well. The, the ELA is, the standards are different for the ELA, like the, the college and career readiness standards for math. It's much more content driven. I think for ELA, it's much more. Um, skill. So I think that the ELA, what I hear from our, our language arts teachers is it's good. It's not set up quite as robustly as the math. So if you go into, um, let's say fourth grade reading. Okay, there's information about literature. And as you can see, they're really only two lessons here, reading for informational text, two lessons, and both involve the key, ide the key ideas and details and the craft and, and structure, I think it is. So it's the same thing, it's just the con there's not as much content, and I think that the content's laid out a little bit differently, I guess would be the other thing. So as you can see, actually with this, there are no videos for this particular one. It's, it's just basically practice activities. Now the grammar on the other hand, which is under the arts and humanities, if you click on grammar, um, it takes you right into the lesson. And this is set up a little bit more like, um, like the math probably parts of speech, the noun. So if I click on, let's say, types of nouns, there are videos here. So the grammar's probably set up a little more. I think the ELA, or I think the ELA and the, the reading in particular, um, I guess it would be a little tougher to do videos on that. So it's a little more of a more activity based. Chuck, can I ask a question? Yeah. 
it's Marty again. Um, for 32 years, I used to teach in Staten Island, New York, in a New York State prison, and we helped the inmates get their GEDs. But I was told by my supervisors now that in 2014, they changed the whole idea so that in the past, social studies and science were basically reading comprehension. You would read a paragraph, you would look at a uh, political cartoon or a graph, and you could get the answers from that. Now, it seems that the GED want people to come into the test, you know, knowing certain things about science and social studies, which is kind of crazy because some of these students haven't been in school in like 20 years. So to try to remember, you know, biology, chemistry, you know, history, whatever, makes it difficult. So when you look at the practice exams or the practices that are in science and social studies, is it based on reading comprehension they get the answers or are they supposed to know certain things? Do you mean for this in the Khan Academy activities? Right. Um, here's, here's the thing. Um, the GD and the high set, they're high school equivalency exams. So they are, somebody who passes those is supposed to be on par with today's high school graduates. Right. So this, the content in Khan Academy related to science and history is at a high school level for those. Um, so they will get, They'll, they'll get a lot of, they'll get, uh, my understanding is they'll get the background knowledge that they need to help to be ready for those tests. Um, I don't know that the activities that they do are going to mimic the GED test or the high set test. Um, I haven't looked a whole lot at the science content, but I know it's at an appropriate level for the students. Um, They'll, they'll develop some of the vocabulary that they need. I think that they'll get some of the critical concepts that they need. So I, I think that it's time well spent. I don't, what I couldn't tell you one way or the other is if a student goes through biology, chemistry, you know, physics in Khan Academy, I don't know if that means they'll be ready to pass the science test or not. Right, but basically uh, in the Khan Academy practice, the information is right there in front of them. They just have to, uh, you know, understand it and answer. Is it multiple choice questions? Um, the I think it. Well, let's let's look at one here. Okay, so here's a question. Yeah, this one's multiple choice. Okay. So when it says, what type of microscopy tools should the scientists use in order to observe these structures, they will have given the answers somewhere before in a paragraph, I would assume. Um, honestly, I, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. I haven't looked a lot at the science content. Yeah, because hey, I mean, it's, yeah. it's Bill. Oh, hey, Bill. Hey, uh, usually they're in the videos and that's where they go to the hint and refer back to the videos in the video section. So it has to be either memorization, either from uh, a text or a video that the student has seen. Okay, that's great to know. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And Chuck, I, I really appreciate you doing this and, and keep up the great work. This, this, was, this was awesome. So I, oh, thanks, Bill. My, my team and I greatly appreciate it. So ah, Hey, that's what we're here for. All right, um, let's see. Do we have any other questions? Okay, good. Yeah, Patricia mentioned too. She saw the, the go-to lesson page. All right, any other questions? Hey, Chuck, Chuck are you taping this? Yes. Okay, so staff who um, actually are not available today will be able to access this where on the PA website? No, I, I, this won't be nearly nice enough to be on the PA Adult <laughs> Resources website. I'll send a link out to all the, the programs, though. Okay, good. Then I can send the link to my other staff. Thank you. Yep, probably sometime tomorrow, Ronnie. Okay, perfect. Thanks.